OK, so we're going to look at a really interesting example of using a fixed point iteration process to estimate the root of a cubic equation, where we can actually measure how quickly our iterative process is converging towards that root. Now, I think this example is really interesting because I've seen this sort of thing done before using quite advanced techniques like the mean value theorem or other results from analysis. But here we're actually only really going to use some relatively simple algebraic results, so we don't really need to use any anything as advanced as the mean value theorem. So this is our cubic, and let's imagine we know that the root is approximately 0 0.7. So we might have achieved this just with a bit of trial and error. And if you substitute in x equals 0 0.7, you'll get something which is negative on the left-hand side. But then if you substitute in something slightly bigger, let's say 0 0.8 or just 0 0.75, you'll get something which is positive on the left-hand side. So you know, in between this negative and this positive value, there must be a value where this is 0, because this cubic function is continuous. So taking this as known that we've got a root roughly equal to 0 0.7, we now need to set up an iterative procedure here. And there's lots of different ways of doing this. You essentially just rearrange this equation into a slightly different form. So here we're going to do this so that we make this x the subject. So we just add 4x and take away x cubed, and then divide by 5, giving us x is 4 minus x cubed all divided by 5. So you can see these two equations are just the same equation written in a slightly different form. And the reason we do this is because now we can define a sequence where the next term, so xn plus 1, is defined as 4 minus the previous term cubed all divided by 5. And the idea here is because this equation is just the same as our original equation, if we don't have the subscripts in there, then if our xn sequence converges to a limit, then that limit will be a solution to our original equation. And we won't go into the details of why this is going to converge, why we know that this sequence is going to work. Essentially, the rule is that if we differentiate this function, so we have d by dx of 4 minus x cubed, all over 5. We differentiate this, we get negative 3x squared over 5. And then if we look at the absolute value of this derivative, the absolute value of this is going to be less than 1, or at least where x is reasonably close to 0 0.7. So I actually have an old video which covers this topic of how you can tell whether or not your fixed point iteration process is going to converge, so I'll include a link in the description to that. But effectively, it's just if the absolute value of the derivative near that point is less than 1, then our iterative process is going to converge. So taking this for granted, and we'll also say that we have some value x0, which is around 0 0.7, we've got our fixed point iteration set up. And now we want to measure how close are we to this root, which we're calling alpha. So you can measure this at the n plus 1th step, so xn plus 1. The distance from our root is just the modulus of xn plus 1 minus alpha. And then we know that xn plus 1, using our iterative formula, we can rewrite this as 4 minus xn cubed all over 5. But then also, alpha is a root of this equation, which means it's also a root of the rearranged version of this equation. So just to write this out, make it really clear, we have alpha is also equal to 4 minus alpha cubed over 5, because alpha is a root to our original equation. So we can now replace the alpha here by taking away 4 minus alpha cubed all over 5. Then you can see we're going to get some nice cancellations. The 4 and minus 4 cancel, and this just gives us, in the numerator, we get a positive alpha cubed minus xn cubed, and all of this is over a common denominator of 5. And this starts to get really interesting now, because we can actually factorise this cubic expression alpha cubed minus xn cubed. You can see this is going to be 0 when alpha equals xn, so we can take out alpha minus xn as a factor. So then we can rewrite all of this as alpha minus xn, and then this needs to be multiplied by, we'd have alpha squared plus alpha times xn plus xn squared. So if you expand these brackets, this would get you back to alpha cubed minus xn cubed. You could derive this quadratic expression here, doing some polynomial division by this term alpha minus xn, if you like. Or you can just check that the brackets expand, and that is indeed valid. So now we've got this far, and you can see this is really interesting, because we can take out this factor and actually take the absolute value of this, alpha minus xn. I'm just going to write this the other way round as the 
absolute value of xn minus alpha. And then if we multiply this by the absolute value of everything else, this is still going to be equal. So multiplied by the absolute value of alpha squared plus alpha xn plus xn squared, all of this divided by 5. So this is all equal at this point. We've got this is our distance from our root to where we're up to in the sequence so far, our n plus 1th term. And then you can see here we've got this term represents the distance of the previous term from our root. So now if we can find some, some sort of bounds or some inequalities on this remaining piece here, introduce some inequality, we could then find a relationship between the distance of the next point from our root and the distance from the previous point from our root, which will tell us then how quickly our process is converging towards alpha. So now before we can get any bounds on this quadratic term, we'll first find some individual bounds on the values of alpha and on each of our individual xn's. So we actually already know that alpha is between 0 0.7 and 0 0.75. And remember, the way we justify this is that if you substitute in x is 0 0.7, you get something negative on the left-hand side, whereas if you substitute in 0 0.75, you get something positive on the left-hand side. So you know that there must be some value between 0 0.7 and 0 0.75 where it's actually equal to 0, and that's our root alpha that we're looking for. So now we can choose x0 to be in the same interval. This is sensible because that's where the root is. So if we choose x0 between 0 0.7 and 0 0.75, this is our starting value. And then what does this tell us about the size of x1? Well, first of all, if we use the fact that x0 is less than 0 0.75, this tells us that x1, which, remember, using the iterative formula, x1 is 4 minus x0 cubed all divided by 5. This is going to be, we're introducing a negative, so we flip the inequality here. This is greater than 4 minus 0 0.75 cubed all divided by 5. And if you calculate this, you get 0 0.715625. But all we really care about for this value is the fact that it's greater than 0 0.7. So we're saying that x1 is greater than 0 0.7, given that x0 is less than 0 0.75. So now if we use the second inequality on x0, x0 is greater than 0 0.7, this has similar implications for x1. So x1, just writing it again, is 4 minus x0 cubed over 5. Again, we flip the inequality symbol here. because We've introduced the negative. So now this is going to be less than the same thing, 4 minus 0 0.7 cubed over 5, just replacing the x0 by 0 0.7 there. And then when we calculate this, we're going to get 0 0.73 and all we really care about for this value is the fact that this is less than 0 0.75. So then we can conclude, we've already seen x1 is bigger than 0 0.7, and we now know that it's also less than 0 0.75. And this is really interesting because we can do this for x2, and we can do this for x3 as well. We started with a value x0, we put it into our iterative formula, and the output was in the same interval between 0 0.7 and 0 0.75. So using the fact that xn is less than 0 0.75, this tells us that xn plus 1, which is 4 minus xn cubed all over 5, this is going to be greater than the same thing but replacing the xn by 0 0.75, 4 minus 0 0.75 cubed all over 5. So you can see we're doing exactly the same calculations as before. So this value is something which is bigger than 0 0.7. And similarly, the fact that xn is greater than 0 0.7, this implies that xn plus 1, which is 4 minus xn cubed all over 5, this is now going to be less than 4 minus 0 0.7 cubed over 5. And all we care about with this is the fact that it's less than 0 0.75. So then we've shown that if xn is between 0 0.7 and 0 0.75, then so is the next term. So we can actually conclude then that since our original starting value x0 is in this interval, then all of our xn are going to be in this interval for all n greater than or equal to 0, and so is alpha as well.
So now returning to this quadratic expression we're interested in, we can see that alpha and our xn are all positive, so the absolute value of this, the modulus, is just going to be equivalent to this quadratic expression. And we can take alpha squared, we know, is less than 0 0.75 squared, and alpha times xn is also less than 0 0.75 times 0 0.75, and finally xn squared is also less than 0 0.75 squared. So this is just less than 3 times 0 0.75 squared, all divided by 5. And when we calculate this, we get 0 0.3375 as our upper bound on the absolute value of this quadratic error term. So then putting this into context, what we've shown is that the distance from the n plus 1th term from the root is going to be, because this quadratic is less than 0 0.3375, this is going to be less than 0 0.3375 times the distance uh, modulus xm minus alpha, the distance from the previous term from the root. So if we're at some distance from the root, then we go to the next term, we're going to be less than 0 0.337 time, five times that distance, which is really nice. But we can go further with this, because we also know that the modulus of xn minus alpha is less than 0 0.3375 times the modulus of xn minus 1 minus alpha going to the previous term. So then this becomes less than 0 0.3375 squared times the distance from the previous term to xn minus 1 minus alpha, and we could keep going like this all the way down to the distance from the original term, so we get 0 0.33 7, 5 to the power of n plus 1 times the distance of our initial value x0 from the root. And even here, actually, the distance of the initial value from our root, we're taking our alpha and our x0 both in this interval between 0 0.7 and 0 0.75. So actually, the absolute value of x0 minus alpha, this itself has got to be less than 0 0.05, because they're both in this interval of width 0 0.05. So our worst case scenario is actually that the distance here is 0 0.05. So then we can say that when we've gone on to our xn plus 1 term, we can measure this, how quickly we're converging to our root from above, just by using this upper bound. So we've got the distance to our root is less than 0 0.3375 to the n plus 1 times 0 0.05, which is 1 20th, so I'll just write this as divided by 20. So this gives us a really nice sense of how quickly this will converge to the root. But of course this is just an upper bound, and we can actually find a lower bound as well using the fact that alpha and xn are greater than 0 0.7. So if we just repeat the same sort of procedure here, we'd have xn plus 1 minus alpha, the absolute value of this, would be greater than and then we'd have here 3 times 0 0.7 squared over 5, so 3 times 0 0.7 squared over 5, and then this is being multiplied by the modulus of xn minus alpha. So when we calculate the 3 times 0 0.7 squared over 5, we're going to get exactly 0 0.294 multiplied by the modulus of xn minus alpha. So then we've got an upper bound, and we've also got a lower bound here, for our next term, how this is related to the distance from the previous term to the root. Then we can keep going like this, and we get xn plus 1 minus alpha, the distance of this from the root will be greater than 0 0.294, again raised to the power of n plus 1, multiplied by the initial distance x0 minus alpha. So now unfortunately here there is no lower bound in general on how far away our initial guess could be from the actual root alpha, but we still get a nice sense that if we choose a value of x0 in this interval between 0 0.7 and 0 0.75, then we know that our next term is going to be, it's going to be greater than this, but it's also going to be less than this distance, 0 0.3375 to the n. So our next term is always going to be around 0 0.3 times as far away from the root. So let me just write this in a single line to make it a bit clearer. We're saying that the distance from the next term to alpha, our original root, is going to be less than 0 0.3375 to the power of n plus 1 times our initial distance of our initial guess from the root. And it's also going to be greater than 0 0.294 to the power of n plus 1 times our 
initial distance x0 minus alpha, the absolute value of that. So this is telling us then that if we go along one more step in this iterative procedure, it's going to be about 30% of the distance from the root as our previous step was. And if we go again, then the next term is going to be 30% of the distance again, and so on like this. So it gives us a really clear idea of exactly how quickly our procedure is converging to the root of this cubic equation. I think this is really amazing that we've actually been able to determine the rate of convergence towards alpha without actually knowing what the value of alpha is. So for all of our calculations we just know that it's in this interval here, but then we know now that after, let's say after 100 iterations, we can really precisely determine how far away from this alpha we're going to be. We can also do this the other way around as well, that let's imagine that we want to have a certain desired level of precision. Let's say we want this accurate to 20 decimal places. Then we know that our distance for our n plus 1th term to alpha is less than, we've got this bound here, which doesn't even depend on our initial guess, x0. Then we could just solve this as an equation. So if we want 20 decimal places, this needs to be less than 10 to the power of negative 20. So we could find a suitable value of n big enough so that this inequality holds, and then that would guarantee that our nth term then would be accurate to at least 20 decimal places.